Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to the disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Not only is it the sixth Sunday of Easter, it's also Mother's Day, when we celebrate the many ways that mothers show love to their children. But it can be a difficult day for those with contentious relationships with their mothers, or for those who want to become mothers but can't. It may be helpful to expand our notion of Mother's Day this year, at least for this hour, in the closing devotion for our confirmation class, I've been using a version of the Lord's Prayer from the New Zealand prayer book that begins in this fashion. Eternal Spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. Do you ever take time to contemplate the mothering traits of God? Jesus tells his disciples that he won't leave them orphaned. They will be bathed in love. He will send the spirit of truth to be their advocate, their helper who is ever present with them. An alternative translation describing this promised one might read, this is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees her or knows her. You know her because she abides with you and she will be in you. I don't know about you, but mothers are like that. They just stay with you. So our God is our mother as much as our father. And nowhere is that clearer than in the words of Paul at the Oropagus in Athens. But before I zero in on that, let me set the scene. In the preceding verses, we learn that Paul has been debating with Epicureans and Stoics, two prevailing philosophical ways of life in both the Greek and Roman worlds. In a nutshell, Epicureans had no use for religion, did not believe in an afterlife, and lived for the pursuit of happiness, no matter what life dealt them. Stoics, on the other hand, were, were more religiously minded. They championed logic, control over their emotions, and pursued virtue as life's goal. Well, Luke tells us that the Athenians were very, a very inquisitive people, and they invited Paul to share more about this divinity that he had been talking about. Paul then shares what he has come to know about God. If you remember last week, uh, our first lesson, a little earlier in Acts, we heard about a young man named Saul tending people's coats while they stoned Stephen. Well, this is the same man with a different name, a post-Damascus Road missionary to the Gentiles, Paul. He needs a jumping off point into the Athenian culture, 
So he applauds them for their religious appetites and tells them that he has seen an inscription on an altar in their city to an unknown God. And from that starting point, he tells them about the God who created all things, the one who is both so far beyond and yet so near. He says that God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. That depiction of God has always resonated with me. But until this week, I hadn't made the mothering connection. Every single one of us in our mother's womb experienced being in one in whom we lived and moved and had our being. And Paul builds on that point by quoting one of their poets that declares that we too are God's offspring. He then cautions folks about making idols of God out of gold, silver, or stone, or through their artful imagination. For all of our idols, even our metaphors, will fall short in depicting the mystical essence of God. This leads to Paul's climatic declaration about a coming day when Jesus will judge the righteous in righteousness, which God has revealed by raising him from the dead. It's a very bold assertion. And if we read on past where our text ended today, then I imagine it was the Epicureans who scoffed at the very idea of the resurrection, because we hear some scoffed. Yet Paul did gain a few converts, and some wanted just to hear more. For many millennium, we humans have debated about God's existence, God's traits, and how we experience God. In his book of short stories, called, titled The Orthodox Heretic, Christian philosopher Peter Rollins shares an insightful story about the futility of such pursuits. There was once a world-renowned philosopher who from an early age set himself the task of proving once and for all the non-existence of God. Of course, such a task was immense. For the various arguments for and against the existence of God had done battle over the ages without either side being able to claim victory. It was, however, he was, however, a genius without equal, and he possessed a singular vision that drove him to work each day and long into every night in order to understand the intricacies of every debate, every discussion, every significant work on the subject. The philosopher's project began to earn him some respect among his fellow professors when as a young man he published the first volume of what would turn out to be a finely honed, painstakingly researched, encyclopedic masterpiece on the subject of God. The first volume of this work argued persuasively that the the various ideas of God that had been expressed throughout antiquity were philosophically incoherent and logically flawed. As each new volume appeared, he offered time and time again devastating critiques of the theological ideas that had been propagated through different periods of history. And in his early 40s, he finally completed the last volume which brought him up to the present day. However, the completion of this work did not satisfy him he still had not found a convincing argument that would demonstrate once and for all the non-existence of God. For all he had shown was that all the notions of God up to that time had been problematic. So he spent another 16 years researching arguments, interrogating them with highly nuanced logical analysis. But by now he was in his late 50s and had slowly begun to despair of ever completing his life project. Then, late one evening, while he was locked away in his study, bent wearily over his old oak desk, surrounded by a vast sea of books, he felt a deep stillness descend upon the room. As he sat there, motionless, everything around him seemed to to radiate an inexpressible light and warmth. Then, deep in his heart, he 
he heard the voice of God address him. Dear friend, the task you have set yourself is a futile one. I have watched all these years as you poured your being into this endless task. Yet you fail to understand that your project can be brought to completion only with my help. Your dedication and single-mindedness have not gone unnoticed, and they have won my respect. As a result, I will tell you a sacred secret meant only for a few. Dear friend, I do not exist. Then suddenly everything appeared as it was before. And the philosopher was left sitting at his desk with a deep smile spreading across his face. He put his pen away, left to study, never to return. Instead, in gratitude to God for helping him complete his lifelong project, he dedicated his remaining years to serving the poor. This story can, can blow your mind a bit. I think some of my Jewish friends would really appreciate it. In a like manner to how Paul was telling the Athenians that their depiction of God in idols was just too small, this story can help us to see how our ideas about God are often too small. God is way beyond any of our metaphors and philosophical ideas in which we might assume reveal God's existence. We're really not that much different from some of those Athenians and their many idols. We make idols out of money, celebrity status, sports, pursuit of happiness, national allegiance, health and fitness, romance, just to name a few. A common idol is what I've come to call the, the vending machine God. God will grant me the favor I ask for if only I pray hard enough. But God is so much more than any box we ever try to place God in. As I reflect on that story from Peter Rollins beside Paul's testimony at the Oropagus, I might surmise that the one in whom I live and move and have my being doesn't exist. My God is beyond existence. Whereas the theologian Paul Tillich proposed the ground of being, the ground of all that exists. Perhaps God only exists in ways that are beyond a purely material existence. And what actually matters isn't whether or not God exists, but the ways that we experience God's life-giving, loving presence. Perhaps this is what Jesus was getting at by saying, I am in my Father. Today, feel free to substitute mother. And you are in me, and I am in you. What both Jesus and Paul want their hearers to recognize was God's forgiveness and love. It's like a mother or father's love, but so much more. It's at one and the same time, cosmic in scope and within each breath we take. So, on this Mother's Day, as we remember that we live and move and have our being in God's infinite love, may we let that love be our guide. Let us go forth to serve the poor, bring justice to the oppressed, and be agents of peace and healing in this broken world. For isn't that what a loving mother would have us do? Amen.